Hey guys and welcome back to my channel for another video. You may notice this week's mystery is not on Wednesday and that's because I'm actually working with Now TV again. Now TV is a leading UK streaming service with some of the best TV, box sets, movies, sports and kids entertainment that you can watch when, where and how you want to watch. You can stream content to watch through the Now TV app available on over 60 devices including the Now TV Smart Stick and Smart Box. On the 1st of October Sky launched a new Sky Crime channel and it is available on Now TV. Sky Crime is the new home of premium US true crime from Oxygen and HBO as well as Jupiter and Woodcut. These documentaries are some of the highest quality I've ever watched. They have some of the best accounts of true crime I have ever seen. Sky Crime will take you on a journey through some of the most harrowing and shocking crimes you've ever heard of. It really will make you question everything. True crime is a very popular genre at the moment. I mean, you probably get it if you're watching my channel. And Sky Crime gives you the most well-rounded, high-quality looks in some huge cases. Today's video is going to focus on the disappearance of a woman called Susan Cox Powell. The two-part documentary, The Disappearance of Susan Cox Powell, is available to stream now via the Now TV Entertainment Pass, which costs just $8.99 a month. The documentary is about three hours long in total and today I'm going to be telling you all about the case in my usual format. The video is going to be exactly the same as it usually would be. I can't wait to hear your thoughts and feelings on this case and I urge you to go and watch the documentary for an even more in-depth understanding. It's the kind of case where you need to see it to really believe it. Let me tell you the story of poor Susan Cox Powell. Susan Cox was born on the 16th of October 1981 and grew up in Puyallup, Washington in the USA with her three sisters and her parents. She was raised a Mormon belonging to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. She was one of the kinds of people who dreamed of one day being a wife and a mother. That was her life goal and she was described as very happy, full of life, positive and very determined person by her family. Eventually, Susan meets a man called Joshua Powell through the church and they have a very quick courtship before marrying on the 6th of April 2001. Susan was 19 and Josh was 23. In the Mormon church, it's the norm for people to marry and have children very young. They dated for just two months before getting engaged. Josh was a very specific type of person. He's the kind of guy that just not everyone gets on with. He was very loud and very opinionated. His opinion was usually the only correct one. And according to family, he showed signs of being quite possessive early on. Susan's parents didn't even want her to marry him. But Susan was besotted with Josh and totally in love with him. And her wedding was the happiest day of her life. They live in Puyallup for a while, living with Josh's father, Stephen, at their family home before eventually moving to West Valley City in Utah. Once they're there, Susan discovers that she's pregnant and would eventually go on to have two sons, Charlie, born in January 2005, and Brayden, born in January 2007. She seemed to be genuinely really happy. All of her life dreams had come true. She was a wife and had two sons who she absolutely doted on. They were the light of her life. Everyone around her thought that she was genuinely really happy. Most people had no idea that anything was wrong. But behind the scenes, Susan wasn't exactly leading a fairy tale life. She confided in a couple of friends that she felt like she was being controlled by Josh. He treated her badly, and it seemed like at least on one occasion, he had physically hurt her. He had a hell of a temper and eventually got to the point where Susan was just seeking a way out of this relationship. And Josh obviously was not happy about this. Allegedly, he told Susan, over my dead body, will you leave me and have those boys? So they continue living together, raising their children until December 7th, 2009. On the morning of December 7th, 2009, Josh's mother, Teresa Powell, gets a call from the person who usually looked after the boys while Susan and Josh worked. This person says that Susan hasn't brought the boys along as usual and she was feeling a little bit concerned. So Teresa tries to get in contact with Susan and Josh to no avail and eventually actually goes to visit the house with her daughter Jenny, Josh's sister, finding no trace of the family at all. Eventually they have to call the police to report them as missing. The police arrive at the scene and make the decision to break into the house through a window, worried that the people inside had been poisoned by carbon monoxide. But inside they find a strange 
strange scene. There's no one there, but they notice that the sofa has been freshly cleaned and it's still wet. Two box fans are pointed at it in an apparent attempt to try and dry it. Susan's bag, purse and ID were all found inside the house, her bag still on the side in the bedroom where she would usually leave it. People start to walk in and out the house, including Josh's mother and his sister, until Ellis Maxwell, who would go on to become the lead detective in the case, arrives and kicks everyone out because he realised that he should probably try and preserve this as a crime scene. And he starts the process of photography and forensics. They discover that Susan never arrived at work that morning and Josh and the two boys were also nowhere to be found. The first port of call is to try and find out where the family were last seen, to try and put together a timeline of events here. Once the word spreads that the family is missing, a friend of the family's called Giovanna comes forward. She says that she spent the afternoon with them on the 6th, the day before. She'd visited the Powell household and had sat in the lounge with Susan just having a catch up, while Josh cooked pancakes for dinner and served it. Now, Giovanna actually said that she thought this was slightly strange at the time because Josh usually refused to cook. He thought it was Susan's job to cook for the family. Um, so Josh is cooking dinner and then after a while, Susan suddenly comes down very, very tired and says she wants to go to bed. So she does. Josh says that he's going to take the kids out sledding and gets them ready and actually leaves the house with the kids before saying goodbye to Giovanna. So she's left in the house alone while Susan's upstairs sleeping. And this was around 3 p.m. Everyone is desperate to get hold of the family and eventually, 18 hours after he was last seen, Josh answers his mobile to Giovanna. He's oblivious to anything being wrong. He says that he's in West Valley with the kids and he'll be home soon. He doesn't know where Susan is. She should be at work. His reaction though to hearing his wife is missing is strange because he doesn't drive straight home. It's actually later shown that he drove 20 minutes in the opposite direction, at which point he leaves Susan a voicemail and then he turns around and drives home. On the journey, he speaks to Ellis Maxwell directly, who tells him just to come straight home with the kids. Don't stop anywhere, don't feed the kids, just come straight home. But Josh doesn't. He actually drives to Susan's work and calls her, leaving her a message saying that he's there to pick her up. Even though he's been told multiple times by this point that Susan never turned up for work that day. She's missing. Is it denial? or is it something else? Josh is interviewed by the police at 7.15 that evening. His story is strange to say the least. He says the last time he'd seen his wife was just after midnight because between 12.30 a.m. and 1.30 a.m. he decided to pack the boys up and go camping in the desert. So that's what he did. He just went camping in the middle of December, in the middle of the desert. It was minus seven degrees Celsius outside, about 18 degrees Fahrenheit. The police talked to him for about an hour before letting him go home to his children. He's going to be worried about his wife, they thought. But he's released on the condition that he had to turn up at the station again the next day for a proper scheduled interview but he doesn't turn up for this scheduled interview the next day. According to witnesses, he just spent the next morning pottering around the house, cleaning and doing laundry. He does eventually turn up at the police station, but hours late with no explanation as to why. The police repeatedly ask him where he thinks his wife could have gone. Would she have left of her own accord? Is there anywhere he can think of that she would go? I don't know is his only answer. When pressed as to whether Susan had any mental health issues, he says she was suicidal. Now the police weren't immediately able to get a search warrant for the house and vehicle because there was no evidence of any foul play. For all they knew, Susan had just decided to leave. But eventually they do manage to get a search warrant. It just takes a couple of days, I think. And Susan's mobile is actually found in the car that Josh had been driving that day, the family minivan. Strange, when he'd been trying to call it, he left her a voicemail, he called her more than once. Did he not hear her phone ringing in the car? Why would he leave for a random camping trip in the middle of the night and take his wife's mobile with him? When a search warrant is later secured, the police take in the minivan to search. They tell Josh that they won't have the car long, that he can just wait for it, they'll give it straight back. But he doesn't wait. He immediately heads to Salt Lake City Airport where he rents a car. He has this car in total for about 20 hours and in that time puts 806 miles on the car. His wife is missing. Most people will be at home waiting for her to come back, walking the streets, handing out posters. 
Josh is driving 806 miles in a rented car to an undisclosed location. In the house, the police find minute blood drops on the tiled floor just to the left side of the sofa that had been mysteriously cleaned when the police discovered the scene. The specks of blood were so minute that it was speculated that they may have come from someone just coughing up blood. The blood was later determined to be Susan's. The more the police investigated this case, the more they looked into Josh, the more suspicious things got. The general consensus on the police's side seemed to be that Josh had actually strangled his wife on the sofa before cleaning it to get rid of the evidence. Whilst he was interviewed, they said, they noticed that he seemed to have a particular fixation with his hands. He kept looking at his hands, playing with his hands. When they mentioned his hands, he got really jittery. Um, and they thought that this meant that he may have physically strangled her. And Josh also had a fascination with true crime shows. Now, if you're watching this, you also have a fascination with true crime. I have a fascination with true crime. That's a given. It's normal to be intrigued by the morbid. It's a normal part of the human psyche. But Josh would openly tell people that if he murdered someone, he would bury the body in a mine. Almost genius, because across Utah, there are hundreds of mines in the desert. Some small, some huge. Almost all are impossible to search. So this sort of like led the police down the path that Josh has killed his wife and buried her in a mine in the desert. It really doesn't take long for the police to name Josh as an official person of interest in this case. And from that moment on, he refuses to say another word. Police questioned everyone in Susan's life, looking for any clues as to what might have happened to her. Although suspicious of Josh, was it possible that she'd run away? The general thought amongst friends and family was that no, she would not have left her sons under any circumstances. Eventually, police find out that Susan actually had a safety deposit box and in it, they find some very concerning things. Turns out that Susan had actually been consulting with a divorce lawyer before her death who had told her to go through the house and record everything, just for divorce purposes. If her and Josh split, then she needed to be aware of exactly what they owned. It was taking an inventory of all their belongings. She says on the tape that she's filming this just in case anything happens to me. And then she locks it away in her safety deposit box. Also in the box, they find Susan's handwritten will. On the front, she'd written, for family, friends of Susan, all except Josh Powell, a husband. I don't trust him. She writes in the will, if I die, it may not be an accident, even if it looks like one. Take care of my boys. So this is a woman who is clearly scared for her life. She is anticipating that one day she's gonna disappear, or one day she's gonna die in an accident, and she is saying it's not an accident already. For Susan to be consulting with a divorce lawyer was a big deal. As I've already mentioned, she was a Mormon, part of the Latter-day Saints, and they don't exactly view divorce in the most positive light. And Susan was very religious. Her religion was everything apart from her sons. It would have been a huge deal for her to even consider divorce, let alone actually consult a divorce lawyer. So here we've got a very unhappy wife and a husband who she's clearly terrified of and absolutely does not trust. But Joshua Powell isn't the only questionable character in this story. Enter Stephen Powell, Josh's father and Susan's father-in-law. This is a weird guy and Susan made no secret of the fact that she didn't like him, she hated him. Naturally, the police interview Steve as they did with all family members and he says something that they just did not expect to hear from Susan's father-in-law. Steve openly admits that he had an infatuation with Susan, something he described as very deep feelings. He says that his feelings had first developed when Josh and Susan lived with them when they were very first married in 2001. By 2009, those feelings had spiralled completely out of control. We're not just talking a little crush here. Steve was obsessed with Susan. He seemed to want to document everything in his life. He kept personal video journals which is fine, but he would also constantly video Susan and she seemed to be more than aware of what he's doing. He would film her backside as she would walk away from him, zoom in on her crotch as she got into cars. He would follow her around and literally just video her walking through the streets. She's obviously not aware every single time she's being taped, but on the occasions that she is, you can tell that she's incredibly uncomfortable. 
I implore you to watch a documentary and see these videos for yourself. You'll be absolutely blown away. Steve commentates a video saying that he knows she's doing certain things because she knows he's there, that she's flirting with him, teasing him, everything she does in his head is for his benefit. The reason that Susan and Josh ended up moving to Utah was because she felt so uncomfortable with all this attention coming from Steve. Josh was likely very aware of this, but he never confronted his father as far as we're aware. And so Steve's obsession just continues from afar. It's worth saying though that Steve had an airtight alibi for the time that Susan disappeared. He was in Washington with three of his adult children and therefore he couldn't have physically been involved in her disappearance. But what about emotionally? Josh was one of five children to Steve and Teresa Powell, who had a very messy divorce in the 90s. Steve would often talk about how much he hated his ex-wife. Their children were Josh, Michael, John, Jenny and Alina. Jenny was one of the first people to notice that Susan was missing and that something was wrong and she has been very outspoken against her father. The general Powell family dynamic is very, very strange. Alina defends her father saying that Susan fled back with him and made him think that he had a chance. And the boys all idolised their father who was described as narcissistic and obsessive. Josh and Steve were incredibly close, they were the best of friends and Josh would confide in his father about everything, including any marital problems. But aside from Steve, Josh was definitely closest with his brother, Mike. Now police are almost immediately suspicious of the entire Powell family, they're just very very odd. Susan is still missing and there's no proof that anything untoward had happened to her. Without a body, there was very very little they could actually do to help. They begin undercover surveillance of Josh and the entire family, hoping that someone would let something slip. They knew that somebody in his family knew something, but they had no such luck. But they do find out something strange. Mike had contacted a company called Apollo Mapping via email, asking to get a high-res image of a wrecking yard called Lindell's Auto Salvage in Oregon. He didn't say why he wanted the image, he just wanted this image. Mike and Alina also travelled down to Utah from Washington to be with Josh in the aftermath of Susan going missing. On the journey back to Washington a few days later, Mike's car actually breaks down. Now instead of paying and waiting for the car to be repaired, Mike immediately gets it taken to a facility to be destroyed. Why would that be your first port of call when your car breaks down? Like, oh no, better get it crushed. But the police actually found out about this before the car had a chance to actually be destroyed. They take canines to the salvage yard, train to sniff out decomposition, and guess where the dogs head straight to? To Mike's car. They alerted that they could smell human decomposition in the boot of the car, so of course it's all forensically tested and swabs are sent off. The police begin to speculate. Did Josh kill Susan and then use Mike's car to transport or maybe relocate Susan's body? When Josh drove the 800 plus miles in the rental car the day after his wife disappeared, was he heading to Susan's body himself? Did they keep moving it around? But the results came back of the tests and it came back with nothing. The samples were insufficient. And it's so frustrating. You have this family who are acting really, really strange in the aftermath of Susan's disappearance, but they've got zero evidence of anything. The police literally have their hands tied. They can't do a thing. But then Josh's sister Jenny contacts the police. She tells them that she's willing to wear a wire to a family dinner in an attempt to get Josh, Steve or Mike, one of them, to confess something. She did not trust her own family and she didn't have the same unwavering loyalty towards her father that the rest of her siblings seem to have. So 46 days after Susan's disappearance, Jenny heads to the house all wired up. She tells Josh that she's been hearing rumours that he's going to be arrested soon and that she's scared for him. That if he's got anything to say then he needs to say it to her so they can help. She asks him outright where Susan's body is and Josh says that his attorney wouldn't want him to say anything. Steve gets involved and begins to get angry, telling Jenny that she's always had a hard time with reality, this massive argument ensues, but nothing incriminating is said at any point. You see, by this time, Josh was actually back living in Puyallup, Washington, in his father's home. He'd moved out of his and Susan's home in Utah and back in with his family within a month of Susan's disappearance. 
And this made the investigation incredibly tricky for the police in Utah. It's pretty hard to investigate Josh when he's in a different state where they have zero jurisdiction. And Josh repeatedly claimed that he wasn't involved in Susan's disappearance, but point blank refused to cooperate with the police, or even with the Cox family who just wanted to know where their daughter was. He even filed paperwork with Susan's employer to get her retirement money. But at the end of the day, there was no physical evidence that anyone had harmed Susan. Everything was circumstantial. The DA's office wanted to wait at least 12 months to prosecute anyone, seeing as it was a no-body homicide case that the police were pushing for. There was no actual evidence against Josh, and the police knew it. Any good defence team would just immediately push the blame onto his father and the weird sexual obsession that he had with Susan. And Josh and Steve themselves went on a very strange media tour in an attempt to defend themselves. Instead of painting Susan in a positive light, saying they just wanted to know where she was, they missed her, she was an amazing person, pretending to be all heartbroken and upset over her disappearance, they go in at a very odd angle. They start to say in the media that Susan was mentally unstable and very sexually promiscuous. They described her as a very sexual person. They argued that she was still alive and had simply just run off with another man. Steve says that he has all of Susan's private teenage diaries that show proof that Susan was a promiscuous flirt, that somehow this made her a bad person and therefore him and Josh are entirely guilt free. He says in the media that there's so much interesting information written in there, yet he refuses to hand these diaries over to the police. And of course, the police wanted these diaries. Steve said that as Susan had written part of the diaries while she was married to Josh, legally they belonged to Josh and therefore he didn't have to hand them over. The police were desperate to get a search warrant for Steve's house to get hold of these diaries where Josh was now living and they knew that these diaries could be their way in to get this search warrant. So they set up a sting and they trapped Steve into a corner. You see, he's the kind of person who once he starts talking, he just doesn't stop. It's all about him. Police pull in Susan's parents and friends and set up something called a honk and wave, which is basically a way to raise awareness of a cause. Susan's family would stand on the side of the road in Puyallup with signs about Susan's disappearance and try and get people to honk and wave to pay attention to what they were doing. And it was done to raise awareness for Susan, but it was also a setup for Josh and Steve. They set up the honk and wave on the 20th of August 2011, on a route they knew Steve and Josh would be taking that day, I think it was to the bank. And of course, Steve being Steve, he couldn't just ignore it. He pulls over and marches up to Chuck, Susan's dad, and starts talking. But the media was there as well, and everything he said was being filmed. Steve says to Chuck that the police have told him that they believe Susan is alive and that Josh had nothing to do with it. He just seems to talk, word vomit, with very little prompting. He brings up Susan's diaries himself. He states that they're in his house and that Josh's property because they're written whilst they were married. And this is all the police needed for a search warrant. They just needed confirmation that the diaries were in Steve's house. So they get this search warrant. They head straight to Steve's house and what they found was shocking, absolutely beyond belief. One officer described it as a house of horror. The things the police found are just indescribable. They found cotton balls that Susan had used during her time living there that Stephen had saved and put in plastic bags and had dated. There were her used panties, tampons and applicators, toe and fingernail clippings. He'd literally just been going through her rubbish. It's at this point that they recover all of the camera footage of Susan that Steve had taken over the years. Over 5,000 images of Susan, including images that he had morphed himself into, making it look like him and Susan were a couple. There was video footage of him masturbating over images of Susan. They find journal entries about her. Voyeurism just doesn't seem like a strong enough word to describe what was going on here. He was obsessed to another level. And while Susan definitely seemed to be his number one fixation, there were other victims as well. There was footage of other women, including neighbours having been videotaped through their bathroom windows, including young children. Everyone was expecting Josh to be arrested as a result of this search warrant, but they found nothing that made Josh look guilty. Instead, Stephen Powell is arrested almost immediately and arraigned for child porn. It's at this point that the children, six-year-old Charlie and four-year-old Brayden, are taken into protective custody. 
they've been living in the same house as someone who is clearly unstable and who has now been arrested for child porn and Susan's father Chuck begins his fight to get full custody of his grandsons and the kids are given therapy sessions. In the documentary there's a really interesting clip where the therapist asks Charlie, has anyone spoken to you about your mum? And his response is, we can't talk about Susan or camping, I always keep things as secrets. This is a six year old boy. Susan's parents are given temporary custody of the boys whilst Josh is analysed by a court psychologist, trying to see if he could be deemed responsible as a parent. Why would he decide to move back in with his father when he clearly knows him to be sexually deviant? At one point, Josh does seem to be on the verge of getting custody back when the police access some of his hard drives and take a guess what they find a huge amount of pornography, including child animated pornography, depicting scenes of incest with young children. So the police obviously present this evidence of child porn and the fact that he's a suspect in a homicide case, and somehow he's actually still granted supervised visitational rights with the children, whilst the Coxes are granted temporary custody. He's lined up to do a psychosexual evaluation, which included a polygraph test. Josh had refused to talk to the police about Susan for a really long time and this polygraph test was a huge deal because they didn't just have to be sexual related questions, they were able to ask him about anything including Susan. So the police were pretty sure that this is how they were going to get Josh, they were going to get him on this polygraph test, it was all lined up to happen. But then February 5th 2012 happened. It was Josh's day for visitation with the kids. That day he'd gone to the bank, he withdrew some money and then went and bought some gas, petrol. The social worker picked up Charlie and Braden from the Cox's house and took him to Josh's house, a home he was renting just down the street from where he'd been living with his father. As soon as the social worker turns up with the children, Josh grabs them and takes them inside. He locks the social worker out, even though the visits are supposed to be supervised by court order. And once the social worker hears one of the boys crying inside, she immediately calls 911. This 911 call is so frustrating to listen to. The social worker is just not being taken seriously at all. She is saying that she's fearing for the lives of these boys and the operator just isn't really seeming to get it. And sadly, this did result in the lives of two innocent boys because whilst the social worker is outside, Josh is covering the house himself and his children in petrol. He lights a match and the entire house goes up in flames almost immediately. They all died. The later autopsy showed that the boys had also been assaulted with either a pickaxe or just an axe before they died. Why did Josh do this? Did the pressure become too much? Was he guilty and did he feel the police were closing in on him? Was he innocent and depressed over the situation? In the wake of Josh's death, there was Steve's trial. He was being tried on 14 counts of voyeurism and one count of child pornography, with the police hoping for answers about Susan to come out in the trial. However, the judge wouldn't allow any videos of Susan to be included in the evidence because she wasn't there to confirm that she hadn't consented to them. For all they knew, she'd consented and therefore it wasn't voyeurism. And Steve took the Fifth Amendment on any question regarding Susan. He was charged with 10 years in prison and probation for his crimes. But that wouldn't be the end of the strange going ons in the Powell family. On the 12th of February 2013, Michael Powell, Josh's brother, who he may or may not have confided in, slash may or may not have helped him to hide Susan's body, commits suicide. Michael jumped off a seven story parking garage with witnesses backing up the fact that he jumped. In July 2017, Steve is released from prison, detectives wanting to speak to him once again about Susan's case, believing that he had to know something. Once again, Steve did have an airtight alibi for the time that Susan disappeared. He didn't murder her. He was not in Utah, but the police believed that he knew something, that Josh would have confided in him, or maybe Steve was even the mastermind behind the death. But Steve suffers a heart attack and dies before the police can talk to him. So now anyone with answers in the Powell family is now dead. It seems unlikely and highly unlucky that Susan would be a part of this very strange family and then fall foul to someone else, someone random. Could she have just been the unluckiest person ever? Did a random person do this? Or did she run away? It seems unlikely that she would ever have left her sons in the care of Josh, she, she was clearly terrified of. 
For me, the number one thing in this case that screams that Josh did something to his wife is the fact that he went on this mystery camping trip in the middle of the night in December. He literally left the house with two young boys after midnight to go on a sudden, unplanned camping trip. And then Susan just happens to disappear that night. I'm really not buying it. It was later discovered that Steve wrote in his own diary, I feel like Josh did a stupid thing and probably disposed of her body in a truly grotesque way. I think he probably went to some former industrial land just west of West Valley City and cremated her. But to everyone else, he would always fight Josh's innocence. And you would do for your son, I suppose. I do think Steve is at the centre of everything that happened here. He raised his sons in his own image to be as obsessive and narcissistic as he was. I have no doubt that Susan would have told Josh about how uncomfortable Steve made her with all his advances, with all his videotaping. And yet, Josh never really did anything about it. Did it cause a wedge between Josh and Susan? Was Steve so desperate to have Susan for himself that he slowly turned Josh against his own wife? Did he convince Josh to harm her? If he couldn't have Susan, maybe no one could. I have barely scraped the surface in this video, so please make sure you go and watch The Disappearance of Susan Cox Powell on Now TV. You will honestly not believe what you are watching. The home video footage that Steve took still makes my skin crawl just to think about it. It is live on Now TV as of today. Please make sure you let me know what you think of this case in the comments down below. Do you think Josh did it? Do you think he's innocent? Do you think Steve did it? Do you think Steve's the mastermind behind it all? Do you think Susan just ran away? I'm really intrigued to see what you think. Thank you so much for watching and thank you so much to Now TV for sponsoring this video and I'll see you in the next one. Bye guys.